in their plan for the reconstruction of society, the collectivists commit a double error. Whilst speaking of the abolition of the rule of capital, they wish, nevertheless, to maintain two institutions which form the very basis of that rule, namely, representative government and the wage system. As for representative government, it remains absolutely incomprehensible to us how intelligent men can continue to be the partisans of national and municipal parliaments after all the lessons on this bestowed on us by history, whether in England, or in France, in Germany, Switzerland, or the United States. Whilst parliamentary rule is seen to be everywhere falling to pieces, whilst its principles in themselves, and no longer merely their applications, are being criticized in every direction, how can intelligent men calling themselves revolutionary socialists seek to maintain a system already condemned to death? Representative government is a system which was elaborated by the middle class to make head against royalty and, at the same time, to maintain and augment their domination of the workers. It is the characteristic form of middle-class rule. But even its most ardent admirers have never seriously contended that a parliament or municipal body does actually represent a nation or a city. The more intelligent are aware that this is impossible. By upholding parliamentary rule the middle class have been simply seeking to oppose a dam between themselves and royalty or between themselves and the territorial aristocracy, without giving liberty to the people. It is moreover plain that, as the people become conscious of their interests, and, as the variety of those interests increases, the system becomes unworkable. And this is why the Democrats of all countries are seeking for different palliatives or correctives, and cannot find them. They are trying the referendum, and discovering that it is worthless, they prate of proportional representation, of the representation of minorities, and other parliamentary utopias. In a word, they are striving to discover the undiscoverable, that is to say, a method of delegation which shall represent the myriad varied interests of the nation, but they are being forced to recognize that they are upon a false track, and confidence in government by delegation is passing away. It is only the social democrats and collectivists who are not losing this confidence who are attempting to maintain so-called national representation, and this is what we cannot understand. If our anarchist principles do not suit them, if they think them inapplicable, they ought, at least, as it seems to us, to try to discover what other system of organization could well correspond to a society without capitalists or landlords. But to take the middle class system, a system already in its decadence, a vicious system, if ever there was one, and to proclaim this system good for a society that has passed through the social revolution, is what seems to us absolutely incomprehensible, unless under the name of social revolution they understand something very different from revolution, some petty botching of existing, middle class rule. The same with regard to the wage system. After having proclaimed the abolition of private property and the possession in common of the instruments of production, how can they sanction the maintenance of the wage system under any form? And yet this is what the collectivists are doing when they praise the efficiency of labor notes. That the English socialists of the early part of the century should invent labor notes is comprehensible. They were simply trying to reconcile capital and labor. They repudiated all idea of laying violent hands upon the property of the capitalists. They were so little of revolutionaries that they declared themselves ready to submit even to imperial rule if that rule would favor their cooperative societies. They remained middle class men at bottom, if charitable ones, and this is why Engels has said so in his preface to the Communist Manifesto of 1848. The socialists of that period were to be found amongst the middle class, whilst the advanced workmen were communists. If later Proudhon took up this same idea, that again is easy to understand. What was he seeking in his mutualist system? if not to render capital less offensive, despite the maintenance of private property, which he detested to the bottom of his heart, but which he believed necessary to guarantee the individual against the state. Further, 
if economists, belonging more or less to the middle class, also admit labor notes, it is not surprising. It matters little to them whether the worker be paid in labor notes or in coin stamped with the effigy of king or republic. They want to save, in the coming overthrow, private property in inhabited houses, the soil, the mills, or, at least, in inhabited houses, and the capital necessary for the production of manufactures. And to maintain this property, labor notes will answer very well. If the labor note can be exchanged for jewels and carriages, the owner of house property will willingly accept it as rent. And as long as the inhabited house, the field, and the mill belong to individual owners, so long will it be requisite to pay them in some way, before they will allow you to work in their fields, or their mills, or to lodge in their houses. And it will also be requisite to pay wages to the worker, either in gold, or in paper money, or in labor notes exchangeable for all sorts of commodities. But how can this new form of wages, the labor note, be sanctioned by those who admit that houses, fields, mills are no longer private property, that they belong to the commune or the nation?